focus online lecture 211 retina number 63 exam special uh, today's uh, oskis in retina uh, we have with us dr sushma jayana all the way from bhutan uh, dr sushma completed her vr fellowship from lv prasad hyderabad uh, in 2018 and uh, following which she also did uh, another fellowship in shankara eye hospital uh, she has extensive work experience of working uh, at john f kennedy hospital in west africa and also as a retina faculty in lv prasad hyderabad currently she is a vr consultant uh, at the at the national referral center in bhutan uh, over to you ma'am i hope today will be an interactive uh, interesting exam special session for all our residents thank you shifali uh, can i uh, share my slide yeah ma'am sure uh is it visible shafali yeah ma'am it's visible ma'am okay uh first of all let me take a minute uh to thank the entire team of i focus for uh, starting uh, such an uh, brilliant initiative with the uh, so much of uh, uh, high standard lectures especially for free online access which is uh, i think uh, across the country beyond the country uh, the lectures are being uh, followed and you will be surprised and uh, to know that residents in bhutan are regularly following the i focus and they are all uh, uh, familiar with the speakers and the lectures which are uh, there so on behalf of uh, all the residents in bhutan uh, a big thank you uh, to the entire team of i focus so with this i think uh, we'll go ahead with today's uh, oski session uh, before going ahead i think a uh, biggest acknowledgement is to my parent institute uh, adi prasad hyderabad few of the beautiful beautiful pictures here i have used today are from uh, my uh, picture compilation when i was there in hyderabad and few of them are from jd uh, where i'm working currently so we'll go ahead with uh, our today's uh, session which is on uh, oski question patterns which is usually asked in dnb because dnb is most commonly taken exams uh, across country by ophthalmologists and residents so we'll go uh, and see how's the pattern of dnb so usually a uh, recent pattern is around 20 to 25 questions of uh, oskis which has been asked uh, where each question will be having two to five sub questions with the uh, five marks each uh, for each questions and total 100 marks and hardly you will you will be getting around 3 to 4 minutes to answer per question so so today we'll uh, try to have a mock oski question um, with a limited amount of time we have around 50 minutes so uh, we'll go ahead with the first question so uh, what do we have here uh, we have a oct picture which they have given and they have asked us what is the type of the oct and they have asked another question where they have asked us to differentiate between a horizontal scan and a vertical scan so if you have uh, read any of the basic textbooks on oct the initial paragraph and the initial chapters will be on principles of the oct and the types of the oct so usually there is two main types where is time domain and the spectral domain i won't be going into details of each of the topics of the question because obviously we can't do that it's a oski session but i'll surely give you few topics which is a must read and which is expected to uh, know by the students when they go for exams so here in um, we have uh, as we all know when you read those initial topics will be having a time domain oct which is almost obsolete now Uh, where uh, most of the institutes or most of the center will be using a decent spectral domain oct so you can go further step ahead and uh, mention it whether it's an enhanced depth oct or a swept source oct so how do you know that uh, which type of oct so for that you have to see the choroidal structures so if you know the principles of each of the oct it is much easier to recognize what kind of oct it is in enhanced depth oct you know that they have they have shifted a zero delay line from a standard spe spectral domain oct to a little bit behind so that we can have a, a better picture of the choroidal uh, vasculature so compared to sd you will be having a better clarity of choroidal vasculature in enhanced depth oct 
but in swept source OCT, the choroidal vasculature is much more clearly visible all the way till the posterior hallers layer. So why is that? It is because of the wavelength which they use, which is 1060 compared to the normal wavelength, which is around 800. So in, it's very beautifully balanced in SSOCT where because as the depth increases, the resolution decreases. So without uh, losing the resolution, but having the posterior uh, choroidal layers visible. So that is why they use that uh, 1060 wavelength. So the clarity of the posterior choroidal vessels will be much better in SSOCT. So this is, this is how you will be uh, differentiating each of the OCT. So the next question was how to, how to differentiate a horizontal scan from a vertical scan. So um, usually examiners are kind enough. They will be giving you some of the other clues. They want you to get it right. They want you to clear the exams. So here they have given a horizontal scan. They have given a vertical scan. All they're asking you to is differentiate between these two scan. So just use your common sense usually happens that whenever you read too much, you tend to lose your common sense. So don't do that. Consciously try to carry your common sense and logical reasoning with you. So even if you forget what you have read in the textbooks, these logical reasoning comes to your hand. So if you see in this horizontal picture, there is a, a horizontal scan is where the line is passing horizontally. So the, the, number of time it crosses a vessel is lesser than the vertical scan, isn't it? So here the scan is passing vertically. So the number of time it cuts a vessel is more. So that is why the vessel shadows in vertical scan is more compared to the horizontal scan. And other point is that we all know that nerve fiber layer reflectivity is more towards the around the disc compared to the reflectivity, which is away from the disc. When a scan is passing horizontally like this, the RNF layer will be more reflective towards the nasal part compared to the temporal part of the scan. So that is why here the RNF layer is more thicker, which is this, that means this is towards the disc and which is uh, the where the reflectivity is comparatively less that is away from the disc. So these are the two points you have to remember to differentiate a horizontal scan and a vertical scan. So for the read, please do read about principles of OCT. This is a must know. And uh, principles of each one of them, it will be better if you know. And as I told, how to differentiate a spectral domain from uh, enhanced depth from swept source. And also try to know about different patterns of OCT. There are various patterns like volume scan or line scan or raster scan. So please do read about uh, that too. So we'll move on to the next question. Sorry, I put the answer first, okay. So what do we have in second question? We have a picture of a great clinician. Obviously examiners don't want you to remember every scientist by their face. So that is why they have given you a clue in the question. It says he is commonly known as father of macular diseases. And I think his face is worth remembering by face because he is such a brilliant clinician and his classification, which he had proposed at the time where there was no modern imaging modality was available, still holds good even today. And if you're going to take up retina in future, his atlas will be your Bhagavad Gita. So he is none other than Donald Gass, not Trump. So he has given a classification for macula hole. Um, it is clinically based classification. So in exams, that too, especially in OSCE, you have time constraints. So if you can write both the description and the diagram together, it's well and good. But if you have to choose one out of both, please make sure that you write a beautiful diagram with labelings. So that's all exam. What examiner wants you to know, it wants to know is that you know the concept. Either you write a description or you write a diagram with labels, it doesn't matter to them. So make sure you put up a nice diagram with labeling if you have to choose between a description and a diagram. So macular hole classification clinically, uh, this uh, in, in this few points, I need to remind you that you need to remember why is that stage 1A and 1B, why is that yellow spot and yellow ring occurs? That yellow spot usually occurs because the the photoreceptor layer starts separating from the inner retina. 
So there is a gap which starts creating. That is why there is a spot which shows that yellow reflex. In stage 1b, these are all clinical. Stage 1b where the photoreceptor starts retracting. So that is why from dot, it goes to a ring. So that's 1a and 1b and stage 2 where there is a complete full you know, loss of tissue. So that will be a full thickness macula hole. And stage three is more than 400 microns. And stage four, this is where we usually get confused because the complete vitreous separation is separation from the disc, not from the phobia. So sometimes they'll show you a, a, a OCT with a macula hole with the vitreous being separated from the fovea, then don't jump into staging it as stage four. Make sure that you know that the vitreous is separated from the disc also. So if the vitreous is completely separated from the disc, then only it's called stage four. Until then it is stage three. So further read should be on uh, this International Vitro Macular Traction Society classification. They have given a nice classification based on OCT on vitro macular traction and macular hole. Please do read about it. So we'll go to the next question. So we have a clinical photo where we can see uh, uh, literally the retina is behind the lens and looks like a total retinal detachment. And it's an yellowish glow. It looks like an exudative detachment. And when we see it closely, what do we see here? It's a beautiful uh, abnormality of vessels, which we call as telangiectasia. It is clearly seen here. This will be, and, and in the question, they have already given you a clue. It says a four-year-old boy with a unilateral presentation. So it is almost pointing you towards a Coates disease. But whenever a kid comes, with this vague kind of presentation with atypical presentation, which is not matching to the history of uh, trauma or whatever history the parents are giving, then one thing you have to rule out is retinoblastoma. Then it, it should be in, even in your sleep, if somebody asks you what you will rule out as first thing is retinoblastoma. So what helps you in ruling out retinoblastoma is a simple ultrasound B scan. So, Mention that one differential, like the, the second question is already answered. We answered first thing we have to rule out is retinoblastoma. How do you rule out? In such cases, or you know, when in, in older kids, the retinoblastoma need not be a well defined masses, but it, it can be an exophytic type. So please pick up on the application which shows on the spikes on the A scan. So very rarely the calcification can happen in coats also because of long standing exudation, but. Rare things are rare because it is rare. So don't mention it unless it is asked. So first thing you want to rule out is retinoblastoma through a B-scan. What do you want to look in B-scan? Calcification under mass if possible. So there's another uh, picture which shows a, a, a late stage leaking of an FA. And you see this classical vascular abnormality filling up and lighting up in the late stage. And this is classically called the light bulb sign. It is classical for telangiectasia, and telangiectasia need not be present only in courts. There are many cases, many diseases where uh, telangiectasia can be present. So it is not a pathognomonic sign of courts disease, but it is a classical sign. You can see beautiful bulb-like lesions which will be lit up in late stages of FFA. So uh, please do read about the classification which has been proposed by uh, Dr. Shields and Dr. Honauer and also try to know a bit about adult onset coats, how it is different from the uh, coats which affects kids. So do read about that. So let's go ahead with our fourth question. So there are, they have given a B scan and they have directly asked, what is your finding in B scan? So we, uh, we see uh, a defect in the continuity of the choroidal layers. And we see a sharp edges of this defect. And we also see a hyper echoic. So whenever we are describing a B scan, it, you use the term echoic. Whenever you're describing uh, OCT, you use the term reflectivity. Whenever you're using uh, describing angel, please use the term um, fluorescence. Even in ICG, you can use the term fluorescence. So please make sure you use this correct terminologies. So yeah, you see a hyper echoic membranous uh, layer. So what could it be? And what is the differential diagnosis? 
So one thing I need to uh, uh, tell all my resident friends is that if you have two topics to read as a BSCAR and OCT NGO, and you have time to read only one before going to the exam, please make sure you read BSCAN because examiners might forgive you for not reading or not answering OCT NGO questions. But if you fumble in BSCAN, then you might be in trouble. So this is a, a spot a picture of a chorioretinal coloboma. And the main uh, differential will be on B scan, main differential will be posterior stephaloma. So, how do I differentiate a posterior stephaloma from a chorioretinal coloboma? Usually, the coloboma, as we see here, it will be having a sharper edges compared to stephaloma, which will be a slopey edges. Clinically, it is very easy to differentiate a stephaloma from coloboma, where coloboma will be having an actual loss of chorioretinal tissue, but stephaloma is just a slope where the retinal tissue is still intact. So in coloboma in B scan, it is having a sharp edge, but stephaloma will be having a slopey edge. And uh, another thing is the presence of the intercalary membrane, which is usually in uh, we usually see it in coloboma. It is nothing but a rudimentary retinal tissue, which would have, which should have been there, but it is not there. So that sometimes uh, looks like it's bridging between these two uh, borders of the coloboma. Sometimes it has to be flat, and if it is lifted, then it is, uh, it is to be like more risk factor for a detachment to happen. So that thing you should be remembering about coloboma one is that it is sharp edge plus a bridging intercalary membrane. So uh, further read, please do read about uh, classification of coloboma, both by Idaman and by Dr. Lingam Gopal. So Dr. Lingam Gopal classification is a recent one with a very nice uh, description, depending upon the association of coloboma to the disc. He has described, they have described it very nicely with, and classified it. Please make sure you read, because usually we, we finish with Idaman and we don't go further ahead. At If not in detail, at least know the types and stages of the coloboma of Dr. Lingam Gopal. So uh, we'll go to the next question. So in any set of questions, there will be a uh, different level of difficulties. Some will be very easy and few will be moderately difficult and few will be like gold medal questions and extremely difficult. I think this is one of the gold medal questions. So what is the imaging modality? How do you differentiate a fundus fluorescent angiogram from a fundus autofluorescent and name the types of FF which is used? So when you have this kind of, usually, at least when I was in, I had this confusion, like every, everything is black and white, how to differentiate between ICG and FFA and uh, autofluorescence. So one a key uh, point is to look at the disc. So in red free, uh, it is just using a filter, which is blocking the red wavelength or a higher wavelength. So you have the disc, which is not very hypo, it will be bright. In autofluorescence, when you if you know the principle of autofluorescence, then you will be easily knowing that disc is hypo in autofluorescence. In FFA, depending upon the stages of the angiogram, it will light up, but uh, comparatively, it will be more hyperfluorescent compared to ICG. In ICG, you will see more of choroidal vasculature much more clearly compared to FFA. Okay, so it's always the disc which comes to your help when you have to just see a picture without any other clues. So look at the disc, it will help you to come to, a, come to a conclusion. So types of autofluorescence, the, we usually use both blue autofluorescence and green autofluorescence. So here, this was, a, this is a, So this one is a green autofluorescence and this one is a blue autofluorescence. So how do you, what is the difference between, basically a green autofluorescence uses this uh, flash-based camera compared to a blue autofluorescence, which uses scanning laser of thermoscopy camera. So the lesions are more uh, clearly delineated in a blue autofluorescence compared to a green autofluorescence. You, uh, 
usually they might not expect you to answer this one in deep depth, but if you answer, it is a gold medal question. So yeah, please do read about the basics and principles of autofluorescence, ICG and FFA, the dye used, the dosage used and the filters which are used. So these are the basic things which is given in any basic textbooks. So please make sure you read about these things before going to the exams. So we will move to the next question. So we have a wide field of fundus picture, which is showing a total retinal detachment. Looks like the retina has fallen on itself, right? It's, it's a very rare picture where you see a, a, total a total detachment, which is fallen on itself, which is mainly due to GRT. So I have told you the answer, but anyways, how to differentiate a GRT from a retinal dialysis? and mentioned common syndrome associated with this. This is like a spotter closing eyes. You should be able to uh, identify it as a Jane retinal tear. And the main differential uh, which you have to differentiate it, Jane retinal detachment, I'm sorry, a tear which has led into a detachment. So that has to be differentiated from retinal dialysis. I think most of you will be having this table, but uh, let us discuss it in detail because the most common uh, uh, confusion which happens, at least when I was a resident, what, what is this PVD present or absent, the posterior lip is attached to the vitreous or anterior lip is attached to the vitreous. So let's go in a little bit detail on retinal diocese and GRT today. And uh, yeah, the two common syndrome is mostly it is Marfan's and Stickler's and other uh, pathological myopia and also associated with GRT. So what is a common... Uh, differentiating factor, how do I differentiate between a retinal dialysis and a GRT? The first uh, thing is the definition. Dialysis is just a disinsertion of the retina from its aura. So this is the upper picture is a dialysis and the lower one is a GRT. Whereas GRT is a tear. So it need not be from the aura. It can be at any level of the retina. Usually it's in the periphery. And for the definition, it is more than three clock hours. If the tear is three clock hours differentially, then it's GRT. So coming to the vitreous attachment. So vitreous in dialysis, it is attached to the posterior lip of the dialysis. So that is why it is holding on the, the posterior lip of the, I mean, the, the posterior or it is not falling back because the vitreous is adherent to the posterior lip. That is not the case in in GRT. So GRT, the PVD is already present. The posterior lip is free floating uh, and it, has, it might extend the tear and it, it can become a total detachment like uh, I showed in the previous picture. So when you know this is what happens, then it is very easy to uh, decide which one is more dangerous and which one needs uh, urgent referral or urgent treatment. So GRT, since it just rolls back, and falls upon it itself, exposing a huge uh, area of bare RP. The PVR changes, it's going to be more extensive and more rapid, and it's going to get, uh, you know, uh, crumbled up in weeks. So GRT, unless intervened at the right time, the prognosis is poor compared to the dialysis, because dialysis where the vitreous is still attached to the anterior level is holding on, it's not extending. Uh, a dialysis can be easily, uh, you know, repaired. even surgically GRT is more challenging compared to a dialysis. So I hope you remember these uh, few important points between a dialysis and GRT, at least clinically, you should not be able to, uh, you, should not, you should not be having any confusion. Okay. So the common syndromes are mostly Marfan's and Stickler's with the uh, high myopia. So let's go to the next question. Uh, it is asking us to uh, point out the OCT finding. So what do we see here? We see some discontinuation at the level of uh, photoreceptors and extra limiting membrane and the RP. And it looks like a, a macular microhole. And they've asked us, what is the etiology? And it's usually seen when uh, there is injury from a laser pointer or sun gazing or eclipse gazing. So what are the most common symptoms? 
seen here, the patient usually comes with the presence of uh, paracentral scotoma or metamorphopsia and uh, try to know the other causes also because if you remember, if you remember four, you will be able to write two. So other causes are uh, blood trauma. And if we use a, a, a long endo elimination in the VR surgery, if you use it for longer time, that can also lead to a micro hole. So usually when you when we read too much, we don't know when they ask only one or two, we'll get confused like which one to write because you know 10, but they have asked you to write only one. In that case, please write the most common ones and the most important ones. Don't write the rare ones, which is rare. It, it, is, it is logical reasoning, right? You anywhere in life, write the common ones and the most important ones first. So yeah. Uh, further read, you might have to read about a lamella hole and a pseudomacular hole. Because a uh, lamella hole, uh, 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 it, it's simple, but you might have a little confusion because most of the residents will ask, uh, will be asking a pseudomacular hole, or how do you differentiate? See, it's pseudo, it's called pseudo because there is no macula hole. So when you have to decide whether there is a macula hole or not, look at the layers of the phobia. Is there any loss in the layers of the phobia? A pseudo macula hole, all the layers of phobia is intact. It is pseudo because it is looking like a macula hole. It usually happens in epiretinal membranes where it, it curls up the edges of the phobia. So it looks like a macula hole. Even in lamella macula hole, the same thing. Don't look at the phobia layer. Not the entire phobia layer is absent, but a few of them are missing. So that is when you call it as a lamella macula hole. And uh, also they might ask about the operculum. I had, I should have told you when, during the classification of macular hole. This operculum in macular hole is a pseudo operculum. It's not a true operculum. True operculum is when if the operculum contains a retinal tissue. So in macular hole, the operculum is pseudo because it contains glial tissue. It's not an actual uh, retinal tissue. So that is another point which might, they might ask. And also please, uh, Remember about uh, metamorphopsia, types of metamorphopsia. Why, why does a micro, what is micropsia and what are the causes for micropsia and macropsia? So macropsia is when the photoreceptor, the rods and cones are constricted. Uh, so the representation is more, it happens in ERM or macular pucker, but the image looks bigger. So the opposite is in micropsia where the representation of photoreceptors are less. So it, everything looks small, which is usually seen in any kind of cystoid macular edema. So please do remember these things which are commonly asked. So let's move on to the next question. Uh, we have a color fundus photo here. It is showing a, a very extensive flame-shaped hemorrhages. So whenever you see such kind, don't jump into a diagnosis. Don't play it like a urat thing. So play safe like Dravid, look into look into the picture again. Is it really what you think it is or is it something else? Because, you know, sometimes few spotter OSCEs will be kept only to trick you. So don't get into that and they're not so kind enough. So please be, you know, take another 10 seconds, just look into the spotter, whether, whether it is it the thing which I'm actually seeing is what is the thing which I'm thinking. So even though it looks like a diffuse hemorrhages, if you look closely, you see these white centered uh, in, in most of the hemorrhages, which has this white centered dots. So this is a, a rod spot, which we have been reading since our MBBS days. So sometimes these rod spots can be combined with claim shaped hemorrhages. So three etiologies, obviously, you will be knowing more than that. So most common ones are uh, bacterial endocarditis, anemic retinopathy, look Pemia, any, any kind of collagen vascular diseases. So please do uh, know the composition of this white spot, which is usually made of either uh, platelet or fibrin. It usually uh, uh, forms to plug the bleeders. So that is a composition of white spot, white centers, they might ask. And also try to uh, know about different features of anemic retinopathy, clinic fundus features of. So we'll move ahead with the next question. Uh, they have given a B scan. So uh, we see a hyperechoic membrane, which is connecting posteriorly, and it's all the way extending towards the posterior surface of the lens. So you can 
uh, that's the only thing uh, which can differentiate. Uh, it's nothing but a uh, persistent fetal vasculature, but please, uh, uh, this is only for OSCE, but always uh, imaging modality can never lead you to any diagnosis unless you have a clinical picture. So image, a single imaging modality is never a diagnostic curve. So at least for just for the OSCE purpose, this looks like a persistent fetal vasculature. Another one differential important one is a closed funnel RD. Closed funnel RD might may also look like this, but the attachment need not be all the way up to the disc uh, uh, to the lens. So PFE is uh, usually unilateral. And it's usually associated with microcornea, microphthalmus, and also uh, maybe associated with cataract, secondary glaucoma. And this, depending upon the type of the PFV, the severity and the visual prognosis depends. So that is what I want you to read about is the types of PFV, this anterior PFV, this posterior PFV, and this combined PFV. And also please read about the embryology of retinal vasculature, a little bit about tunica vasculosa and the hyaloid artery and when does it regress and all those stuff. So make sure you read a little bit about embryology also. Okay, uh, let's go to the next question. So we have a fundus photo with extremely deep pigmented retina. So it is a uh, directing us towards albinotic fundus. And they have, they have asked what is the cause for the poor vision in such patient and what are the common symptoms associated with it. So it is uh, ocular albinism and unless they give you the other features of uh, skin involvement. So the main cause for uh, loss of vision in albinotic patients is foveal hypoplasia. And that is why they'll be having this pendular nystagmus because they will be having poor vision since the beginning. And they'll be having photophobia because of the scattering of uh, light because they also have the depigmented iris. So the scattering is more so that's why they have photophobia. And because we all know that the decussation is very uh, uh, irregular, it's 90%. Usually the chiasma, there is an equal am amount of fibers which has decussating. And that is why we have a good stereopsis. And that doesn't happen in uh, OCA. So that is why they will also have this loss of stereopsis. So also read about these syndromes and genetics, which is associated with OCA, like... Uh, Chetik-Hegeshi syndrome or um, Pudlock syndrome or Wardenberg syndrome. These are the common ones and few of the associated systemic features like Pudlock uh, is associated with uh, platelet dysfunction. So uh, try to remember a few of the key points in that uh, uh, topics. So the smart thing to do is knowing something about every topic rather than trying to know everything about a single topic. So uh, try to read some of the other few key points like I was telling these are the key points which examiner wants you to know and knowing that even if you don't answer a few questions you will be forgiven but these key points in every topic is very important so instead of leaving off the entire topic like that and trying to finish everything about one topic make sure you read something about every topic so next question we have uh, OCT with uh, Staphyloma, with, with this kind of uh, OCT, you must be able to recognize that this is a myopic patient. This is a myopic uh, fundus. So they've asked us, what is a type of CNMU? So sometimes this myopic, myopic OCT can um, show us this mirror artifact, which is almost here. This is called mirror artifact, which is usually seen in uh, myopic fundus with very high axial length. So in myopia, the CNMU is usually type but anyways, uh, the, the diagnosis based on investigation is only confined to the OSCE. It's not, uh, don't do any diagnosis based only on one imaging. Things. So what can else it be apart from a CNVM, especially myopia? This can mimic a, a bleeding or a forced of work, which is nothing but a, a proliferation of RP because of the previous break in the Brooks membrane. So first of few spots, which can also mimic like a CNMU, but in FA, you will be easily able to differentiate between these two. So <clears throat> please do read about 
definitions of high myopia and pathological myopia where uh, uh, those are the standard definitions like six diopter or 26 millimeter of axial length and pathological myopia again there are uh, to call it a pathological myopia there are different criteria like presence of uh, CRA, chorioretinal atrophy or lacquer cracks or uh, CNEM kind of atrophy diphobia. So make sure you know these components to call, this, call, a, uh, call it as pathological myopia. And also do read about this meta-analysis pathological myopia classification. And there's, um, there is another classification where uh, they have proposed, uh, depending upon the uh, tractional uh, involvement and neovascular involvement and atrophy involvement, the extent of these things, depending upon that, they have uh, put it as an ATN classification. A is atrophy, T is traction, and N is neovascularization. So uh, do read about that also. And MTM classification, macular tractional mac myopic tractional maculopathy. And please do read about the components of myopic tractional maculopathy. These are the few points which, which examiner might want to ask. Okay, uh, we'll go ahead with the next question. So they have asked, they've already given a clue. It is a two month old preterm baby and they've asked the diagnosis. So my first diagnosis looking into the picture will be or retinopathy of prematurity. And they've asked me to stage the disease. So in the right eye, we see that there is a retinal detachment along with dispersed visual hemorrhage with involvement of fovea. So it must be stage 4B. And the other eye, we see a tractional retinal detachment, but the fovea is still intact. So it is stage 4A. So when, when you read about ROP, you know, make sure you read about uh, familial exudative vitreal retinopathy in parallel, because that is another most commonly asked question if they go in the lines of ROP. So usually uh, the differentiation is um, important in terms usually FEVR presence with term babies and uh, uh, the birth weight will be normal. Having said so, ROP can also sometimes present with in term babies with, so, it, but it is rare, so rare thing is to be mentioned, rarely, not commonly. So apart from that, you see this avascular zone in FEVR, which will be avascular for the rest of the life, unlike ROP, which tries to mature. So FEVR follow-up, so uh, such patients should be put on lifelong follow-up because that avascular zone can get activated anytime, unlike ROP, even though ROP can have other... Uh, structural abnormality like lattice and thinning, but they don't need so much of frequent follow-up compared to FEVR. And the clinical picture, as the name says, is exudation. A lot of exudation will be there in FEVR compared to ROP. Again, rarely exudation can happen in ROP also. So yeah, please do read about FEVR. So we'll go ahead with the next question. Mention the funders finding. So what we see is a uh, yellow, uh, whitish yellow spots around the disc, which is bilateral, and it looks like uh, uh, intraretinal, but it is at the level of nerve fiber layer, isn't it? And that is why it is looking more whitish. If it were much deeper, it would have looked uh, more of yellowish. So name two common. It looks like a cotton wool spots and two common systemic diseases which is associated with this apart from diabetes and hypertension and they know that the, when you when they see the cotton wool spot or, or hard exudate and they ask common disease they'll they know that there will be common answer which will be diabetes and hypertension so they want other causes apart from these two so when there is a bilateral involvement of cotton wool spots, which they have so shown, please make sure you write about systemic diseases like HIV retinopathy, most important and the common one, and Prushnas and Prushnas like and SLE retinopathy. These are the things which can also present with bilateral cotton wool spot, especially in the peripapillary area. So please do read about different deposits, yellowish deposits in the retina at different levels. So Drusen and uh, hard exudates, 
stock fix rates and their level of deposition. And even in Drusen, you have types of Drusen, like cuticular Drusen or reticular Drusen. So what is their level of deposition? So please make sure you read about these things also. So uh, this is another question, gold medal question. So describe the classic sign on OCT. So what we see is uh, a very thin uh, OCT with a very thinned out retina, but we also see a fovea which is uh, almost having a cystic kind of spa uh, space here, with hyporeflective cystic space, with a, a ILM almost lying over this cystic space as if it is draping it. So this is called ILM drape sign. And what is a common pathology which is associated with it is juxtafoveal telangiectasia. So ILM drape sign, again, is not a pathognomonic feature of PFT because it is also seen in subacute sclerosing uh, panencephalitis. But uh, it is a classic sign of PFT. So please uh, make sure that you remember um, this ILM drape sign. So if they go towards PFT, they might ask you regarding um, uh, first thing they might ask is the normal uh, hypoautofluorescence for uh, fovea. And, and when you see an autofluorescence, the foveal region is hypo. That is normally hypo. What is the reason for it? So uh, this you must be knowing. And because of the pigments over there, which is lutein and zeaxanthin, so that if you know the principle of autofluorescence and what is the material lipofuscin, which is responsible for the uh, autofluorescence, which is happening. So then you will be able to easily uh, point out why it is hypo because fovea has got these pigments, which is called lutein and zeaxanthin. And that, would, that will they might ask this one if they go around PFT. And also try to uh, briefly remember about the classification of PFT and, uh, am I audible? Yes, ma'am. I think it broke in between, but now you're audible, ma'am. Dr. Sushma? Yeah, uh, Shefali, am I audible? I just- Yes, ma'am, I think you're audible now. I think in between it broke for a minute, but now okay. you're audible. Okay. Is was it in the same question? Is yes, ma'am. Yes. I can I can I continue? Yes, ma'am. Continue, please. Okay. So also read about the uh, classification of PFT and uh, stages and clinical uh, signs of PFT. So any disease, first thing you will have to know about is the clinical signs. So we read so much. Sometimes we we get busy reading about so many uh, advanced thing. We read about classification of CNVM and OCT angio, but we forget to read about clinical appearance or appearance of the uh, CNVM. So please make sure first thing you read about how does it appear clinically, then go into the imaging modality or whatever. So in PFT also make sure you know about the clinical signs, clinical findings like pigmentations or right angle venule and loss of graying of uh, in graying of foveal uh, reflex. So those are the few important clinical signs which they might ask if they uh, go around the topics of PFT. Okay. The next question is, uh, what is this fundus pathology? And they've also given us a clinical uh, picture of... Uh, a flexor, uh, 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 a flexor part of the neck, which is having this opacular uh, uh, brownish lesion. So when you have these two pictures, I don't think it should be difficult for you to uh, diagnose it as a pseudoxanthoma elasticum with a presence of injured tree. So systemic association, yes, we all know this mnemonic uh, Pepsi. So you should be able to uh, tell more than two. Uh, which is most, most common is pseudoxanthoma, as you know. And apart from that, you have paget, so sickle cell, and other hemoglobinopathies and ED syndrome. So one differential uh, diagnosis uh, on basis of fundus, you, uh, if you have to know, is uh, about lacquer cracks. So that they might ask you, or how do you differentiate an injured streak from the lacquer cracks? You, sh you, you should know the basic pathology behind lac lacquer cracks. It occurs in uh, pathological myopia where the Brooks membrane is thinned out, and that is why it breaks. But in injured streak, injured streak, 
There is also a break in Brooks membrane, but the Brooks membrane is brittle here because it's calcification of the elastic membrane, which is there in the Brooks. So that gets calcified. That is why it becomes brittle and that is why it breaks. So that is how you differentiate an enjoyed streak where there is a break in the Brooks, brittle Brooks membrane compared to lacquer cracks where there is a thinned out Brooks membrane where the break happens. And an enjoyed streak, again, the, it is usually the posterior pole around the disc extending from the disc. Lateral lacquer crack, even though it is in the posterior pole, it won't extend uh, all the way to the disc. So that you must be knowing and color differentiation also. So that, that's it about the enjoyed streak. And um, yeah, we'll see. Next question, again, they have told that it is a preterm baby and they have pointed out a single uh, uh, finding which you, they want us to identify, which uh, is pointed out in this arrow. So it, it looks like a notch, so it is called a notch sign. And what is the modification of the ICROP3 classification depending upon this not saying? And if you people don't know, ICROP3 classification has been recently come up. So make sure you go through that. If not the entire article, please go through that summary table in the ICROP classification. So if at all the topic is around ROP, they might ask you this recent uh, development about uh, classification. So this is called a, a not sign in ROP, which they have included in this recent classification. So previously, if you had a ridge in zone two, you would have called it a zone, zone two, stage two ridge. But if it now, if it is stage, if it is in zone two, whatever stage of ROP, if it is in zone two, but a part of it is extending to zone one, then you will mention it as zone one, secondary to notch. So that is the modification which they have told. So if it is this is in zone three, but the notch is extending to zone two, then you will to then you will see zone two, whatever stage of the ROP it is, secondary to notch. So this mentioning of notch is important. And what are the, the, the next question which they might ask is what are the newer modifications which they have made in ICROP3? So the first thing is. The APROP, which we usually used to use, that has been modified into aggressive ROP because APROP is aggressive posterior. This aggressiveness need not be always confined to the posterior pole. And that is why the P is removed. So now you use the term aggressive ROP. And uh, stage five in previous uh, classification, they had just confined, just they had mentioned stage five without giving the details of the type of the detachment. In this classification, they have further categorized stage five into A, B, C, where you have a visibility of optic disc, without visibility of optic disc, and a final stage where the anterior segment gets involved with new vessels and all. And also uh, another important thing is in the definition, when you just write regressed ROP, so now you have to mention what kind of regression is it and how much is the extent of regression, whether it is a complete regression or incomplete regression, or is it a spontaneous one, or it has been regressed after the laser or after the anti -vagive. So mention the extent and type of the regression. So there are many uh, of the modification which is given beautifully in that table. So if you have time, please go through that table and try to remember at least three to four modification which has happened. I know in residency level, ROP is something which is always confined to the speciality and you might not be able to, you know, uh, get to see too many um, patients in ROP. So but that's why you make sure you see as many pictures as you can and uh, read about it. So let's go to the next question. And uh, uh, Shafali, please uh, uh, stop me when the time is up. Hello. Hello. And we have uh, another 10, 12 minutes to go. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so so uh, you can be that examiner who snatches away the paper when uh, time is up, since we are playing this OSCE model. So before she does that, I think we have four more, five more questions, which is left. So yeah, so they have asked us to describe uh, the type of white dot syndrome. So already told us that it is a white dot syndrome. So what, what, uh, what, uh, Subcategory of white dot syndrome is what we have to see. What we see here is that multiple yellowish dots, which are uh, which are medium uh, to uh, small to medium in size, which is 
mostly associated around the disc and the posterior pole. And they've also given us the mid and late phase of FA, where you see this um, hypofluorescence, which is increasing in the intensity, which is uh, leaking with a, a, a classical pattern, which they have asked us what pattern of leak is it is. And we call it as a wreath pattern of leak, which is usually seen in multiple evanescent white dot syndrome. And uh, if, for the people who don't know what a wreath looks like, and this is a wreath which usually the Westerners uh, use it for celebrations. So commonly these Westerners are known to name these signs uh, in a funny way, like hot dog signs or, or donut signs, but somehow you're ex expected to remember, memorize this, and they might be asked in examination. And luckily, I got a pattern with a very beautiful wreath pattern leak, which is of mutes. So it is evanescent because it is very transient. It is usually self-subsiding, which is seen commonly in young females unilateral. So if somebody wants to read about uh, white dot syndrome, there are a few things which you have to know is about APMPP and uh, MUGE and how to differentiate it. And usually APMPP lesions are a little bit more larger and it's usually seen in males and um, in ICG and, and also the appearance of ICG uh, and uh, FA in each of these lesions. Because in mute is the only way, uh, white dot where there will be early hyper and a late hyper leak. In all the other white dots, in most of them, there will be early hypo followed by late uh, uh, staining of hyper. And in ICG, most of them will be hypo because of the loss in perfusion and the blocked uh, fluorescence. And also, re, uh, also read about serpiginous photoautopathy and the differentiating from serpiginous like. Serpiginous like is basically when it involves uh, with the TB and the features are a little bit different compared to the serpiginous photoautopathy. And also write, read about the diffuse unilateral subacute neuroretinitis and uh, acute zonular autoretinopathy. So the, Azure is usually involved with autoimmune diseases like uh, goiter and Hashimoto diseases. And uh, when it comes to Azure, if they ask about autoimmune diseases, they might go towards the cancer-associated retinopathy and uh, melanoma-associated retinopathy. So just briefly know about those things. And do some you know about uh, the nematode which creates this tract and you have the stages. So if possible, try to re read about the stages of those. And it usually mimics uh, RP. So we'll go to the next question. So it's, it's come to the medical retina part. So what is the intravitreal implant which is used? So uh, this is the implant. Uh, this is most commonly uh, used in uh, diabetic macular edema, which is recalcitering or edema due to vein occlusion. So I've already told you the cause. This implant is called Ozodex, Dex implant. And they've asked the doses dose is usually uh, 0.7 milligram. And these doses of the drugs, please, uh, this you cannot remember the doses uh, in one reading or two. So make sure you, you make these stick notes and stick it over your uh, mirror or walls and see it every day. Only then you will be able to remember the doses and definitions and all those things. So that make, so make sure these things are there from the beginning on your mirror or, or, or uh, walls. So, the most commonly used uh, uh, indication where we use uh, Ozodex is macular edema, which is recalcitrant, and uh, other edemas, inflammatory edema, and, uh, and we also use it in Coates disease. And most common complication which it can cause is, cat, uh, is cataract and glaucoma, and uh, sometimes it can predispose uh, endophthalmitis. Uh, it is, can be a predisposing factor for endophthalmitis if you're giving it in a immunocompromised person. So uh, please do read about the trials, uh, Ozodex trials, which is Geneva where uh, they tried Ozodex uh, in uh, vein occlusions and meat study for macular edema. So in trials, I know there are a huge number of trials. We won't be uh, humanly uh, able to remember all the trials. So make sure you read those path-breaking trials and the recent trials. So like Marina and Anchor, they, they are they are the one which which helped us, uh, introduced us uh, to the Avastin or the antivirus in AMD, and EVS study which changed us changed our 
course of treatment in endophthalmitis, post-surgical endophthalmitis. So these are the path-breaking studies which you are expected to remember. And apart from that, recent studies like Hawk and Harrier in, in uh, uh, Brawlistizumab. So those are a few recent trials you need to remember. So the next question is the surgical retina question. They're asking us, the, they've already given it as a perfluoro uh, octane now as a spotter. And they've asked us name two indication where we use this and one complication. So it must be easy. So we usually use uh, PFCL to stabilize uh, the retina. It's, it's commonly called as a, a third hand of a surgeon. So when I'm trying to uh, you know, uh, operate with two, uh, two of my hands and the retina is continuously floating and coming in between. Uh, so uh, we want something to you know, push the retina back and keep it in that place. So that is what PFCL plays like a third hand. It keeps the retina back especially in, uh, in cases of bullous re retinal detachment and Jane's retinal tear, and when you're trying to do a retinectomy, wherever you want the posterior pole uh, or the posterior ret or, or ret retina and such as such to be stabilized, not to move around. So that is where you use PFCL. And other uh, commonly, uh, not so commonly used uh, uh, indication is uh, to lift up the uh, dislocated lens or eye walls. So one of the most common complication because uh, PFCL is toxic and the toxicity is not because of chemical nature, it's because of the mechanical nature. It's a very heavy liquid which has ve with very high molecular weight. So you cannot leave it inside the eye or if at all it goes towards the fovea. It, sometimes it usually happens when the PFCL bubble becomes, uh, you know, in the small bubbles, if we don't drain it completely, it might go and sit over the fovea and starts damaging the RP there. So that is one of the common compli uh, common um, uh, complication which can occur uh, uh, when we are using intraoperatively PFCL where it goes and sits over the fovea and the patient will lose the vision gradually. So apart from that, please try to read about silicon oil. This could have been a spotter on silicon oil also and the properties like viscosity and the most common confusion which uh, which a fellow or resident will be having is about the difference between a 5,000 and a 1,000 uh, centistroke uh, silicon oil. So it is not about the molecular weight. The centistroke is for the viscosity. So 5,000 is the viscosity. It's not the molecular weight. And what is viscosity? Viscosity is the one which helps keep a bubble in form of a single bubble without breaking down. It's the ability of the bubble to form be or like a bubble rather than uh, you know, breaking out in a simple way to make you understand. So the more the viscosity is, the more the ability for a bubble to stay as one. So that is why 5000 oil is, uh, you know, it takes a longer time because it is more viscous. It takes longer time to break down into smaller bubbles. We call it as emulsification. So that is why we use 5000 oil when there is, we need a longer tamponade where you don't want the silicone oil to emulsify faster. So it's not to have a stronger tamponade. Both of them have the same molecular weight and the molecular weight of silicone oil is very less and the specific gravity is also very less. It floats, it's the oil, it floats on the water. Whereas PFCL, it is very heavy, it sinks. So if possible, try to see these uh, uh, surgeries and if it is happening in your institute, the more you see it practically, the more you understand the properties of these uh, uh, it's, it's more difficult to understand very theoretically. So try to go and see these uh, surgeries which is happening. So then you will understand it a little bit more. So next question, the surgical instrument. So uh, and indication for using it. So always whenever they give a forcep or any micro instrument, please have a look at the tip. So tip gives you a lot of information about the function of that instrument. So here you see at the tip, it's bent, it's, it's almost like a plucker, and, and the rest of the thing is flat and serrated. So this is an, this is called Eccardit, and few of the four section of thalmology has these names, so please uh, do remember by name. It's called Eccardit's uh, uh, ILM peeling forceps. It is usually used to peel ILM in macula hole and epiretinal membrane. So also try to remember a uh, uh, few of the other instruments like foreign body force, foreign, foreign body magnet, different sizes, and micro scissors, which is used in diabetic TRDs. 
So other membrane selected for SEP. So those are the things which you have to remember. So uh, another surgical question. The concentration they've already given that it is an SEP6 gas. They're asking you the non expansile concentration and name the other gas tamponet which is usually used. And what is one important precaution which you want to tell to the patient if you're putting gas as a tamponet? So you have to remember the concentrations. Again, please make sure you, you make stick notes and stick it over there and you have to see it every day. You cannot remember it in one or two readings. So Expansile is 100% a non-expansile concentration where you mix SF6 with the air. So that is the concentration which you get in non-expansile. SF6, we use it uh, with 20%. And the other gas which we usually use is C3 F8. And one thing if you want to tell patient if you're putting gas is not to travel in high altitude or, uh, or you know, uh, have this mountain hike or travel through flight at least for four to six weeks and depending upon what gas you have put again uh, that's why i have put this table please make sure that sf6 expands the, twice the amount of what you have injected c3 f8 expand four four times the amount of what you have injected and um, and the um, duration of the uh, effect of the gas also you need to remember so SF6, if you have put, you, it, it'll stay uh, around 10 to 14 uh, days, so hardly two weeks. But if you have put C3, F8, you might have to tell the patient not to travel in air for another four to six weeks because it is going to stay there for around 50 days. So please make sure you read about the concentration of these gases. And what is the most common complication? Why, why avoid traveling in air? Because... The, ex, the gas which was not expansile can become expansile when it is in high altitude. So that can lead to sudden raise in IOP and that can also, which might lead to artery occlusion and sudden loss of vision. So you need to be more cautious such patient. So next question is regarding the dyes. So common macular dye, it's usually brilliant blue green and two other dyes. It must be easy for you. The concentration, yes, again, you have to remember the concentration of few of these important dyes. BBG is usually 0 0.05. And the other dry dyes which we use is transalone and ICG is hardly used and because uh, it's 0 0.05 to 0.5%. It's been uh, proven uh, repeatedly to be retinal toxic. So we uh, usually don't do ICG, use that ICG, but uh, other dyes like trypan blue, it's not only used in cataract, it can be used in posterior segment surgery also, but the concentration will be a little different. I think in cataract, you'll be using 0 0.06, but here it will be around 0.16%. But um, you should be knowing what dye stains which part of the retina. So BBG usually style, uh, stains uh, ILM, but uh, Tripan Blue stains ERM, and uh, ICG again stains uh, ERM. So please make sure you know, I'm sorry, ICG stains ILM, uh, Tripan Blue stains ERM. So please make sure you, you know what dye stains which structure they might actually uh, ask, and also the uh, positive staining and negative staining and those things they might ask. So I think this is the last question. And uh, this was the question for me when I was a resident. So that's why I had to put it. So this is one of the very few peculiar forceps with peculiar action. So again, you see the tip to see what kind of force, uh, forcep it is. So this is a plug holding forcep. The peculiarity of this forcep is that it is reverse acting. Very few forceps in ophthalmology is reverse acting. And this is one of the forceps. That means when you press the handles, the mouth of the forceps is going to open. So other forceps, the mouth is going to close when you press, but this one is going to open. It's usually used to you know, open and close the plugs, the ports, which is uh, uh, not valved. Now it is the valved uh, port are coming, which are 23 and 26, 25 gauge ports. So those which have we use this thing to remove and replace the plugs. So I think uh, before I conclude, uh, I just want uh, all our resident friends to remember one message. Uh, this actually was told to me by my mentor. That, uh, you know, uh, usually we try to give our 200% only when there is an exam coming up. So 
that's when he told me that you know consider every patient who is walking into your clinic as a question paper and every time you treat a patient successfully that means you have passed the exam so if we go with this attitude i think i don't i think we don't need a special preparation for the exams as such but having said that we know the stress which gets us during the exam so that is when we need to go to these smart memories which we would have made through notes which we would have stuck in our walls trust me these are the memories which are going to save you for the day when you forget everything which you have read so make sure you make these memories from the day one so with that i think i'll end my um, talk for today uh, chef ali thank you so much ma'am for that overview i'm sure it was a tough task to uh, concise everything in manar also ma'am we have uh, dr tara prasad das sir today with us uh, uh, here in the evening uh, sir is a pioneer in doyen and ophthalmology uh, the founder person of uh, vr services in lv prasad the mentor of mentors so we are lucky to have you here good evening and welcome oh oh safali oh, i have message to santosh that i am learning i just learned so many thing from uh, from sushma so i will stay stay put with that you already anyway past uh, five minutes past your allotted time so sir, good luck lucky to have your opinion and some tips for our exam going residents sir oh <laughs> luckily i don't have to prepare an exam <laughs> but what sushma told in the, in the end is very important that learning is a continuous process is just not uh, learn something and forget it and also don't collect points do a cme cpd point just to satisfy the regulatory authority but should be learning continuous learning and and you and santos everybody doing so well congratulations and uh, sushma did a brilliant job thanks sushma thank you thank you dr dipidi mam one chat question i'll just quickly take uh, can you explain about the operculum that you were talking about in one of your slides the true or the pseudo operculum yeah so uh, usually uh, in macular hole uh, we describe uh, uh, operculum in stage 3 so that's when uh, there is a, a, a part of a glial tissue which gets separated from the fovea so this is a pseudo operculum because it is not a real tissue so we call it a operculum when the the content of the operculum is a real retinal tissue like in a retinal tear or horseshoe tear the operculum of the horseshoe tear so that is a real tissue but here it is a pseudo tissue which is a, either containing a glial tissue or or sometimes a part of photoreceptor but uh, this is a pseudo operculum which you see in macular hole compared to the true operculum which you see in other cases okay ma'am and ma'am any atlas that you would recommend to go through for the pictures fundus pictures or oct pictures yeah uh, i think uh, uh, sn sn group has got a uh, uh, beautiful atlases on on b scan and ffa and uh, for rop we are about to come up with a beautiful atlas just for rop but anyways if it that will be too much for uh, uh, residents but anyway uh, atlas is the easiest way to read i guess and that is why i like uh, uh, kanski also because it's more of pictures the more illustration you have the more memory you create better memory you create so in that way kanski i love kanski to start uh, reading of thalmology kanski is never enough but that is where you have to start from yeah we had few other clinical questions but i think it got covered in the explanations that you were giving uh, tpd sir any concluding remarks from your side Oh, 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 uh, not really, not really, Sifali. So no, uh, um, I like that word Kansky because I also have uh, enjoyed reading the book and seeing the pictures. But then uh, pictures tell certainly more information than uh, reading words, and that stays in your mind all the time. There's a nice book written by by German group. Um, About those, I was saying, talking about the red sign. Similarly, they have got a wonderful book of those pictures, but then that is not required right now. I only remember that when I first time heard this uh, encovi sauce in my MBBS days, uh, liver hepatitis, hepatitis, and also I under what is encovi sauce? Nobody told me what is encovi till I took a lot of many years <laughs> to learn that encovi is a fish, which is a, a, a gross in Japan uh, sea. So no, no more, and uh, I'm sure I do not know whether you had OSCE for other areas also, and um, because Susma is our our fellow and faculty, and I requested her to share the link. Uh, I didn't know how to otherwise to go, 
so i i should intrude it into the more elite faculty uh, thing otherwise no and i already taken permission and and uh, asked santosh to excuse me for this intrusion happy to see he pardoned me for this uh, but uh, no no further comments right now thank you people sir. must be hungry it is already 9:30 so <laughs> sorry for extending <laughs> <laughs> next we'll see you all on june 17 we have a special lecture uh, regarding challenges and opportunity in diabetic retinopathy screening by professor bnr subodhi so see you all there good night thank you. good night Take thank care. you so much ma'am